So anyone here thinking of dying had better see me first. <laughs> so I'll fix you up on ready for the journey. Um, and some of you need to see me, I'll tell you that. Um, our our generalised topic uh, this morning is uh, climate change and the Millennium Development Goals. Um, our panel um, our speakers is Dr Mary White, Professor Tony McMichael and Dr Richard Dennis. Um, I've been instructed to be strict on time, um, but however I have to be fairly careful with Mary because she's a patron like I am. and. Um, so I might be a shade more liberal with her. Mary, of course, is an extremely distinguished scientist, a paleo-environmentalist and a writer on the evolution of the Australian continent and its biota, and how to achieve sustainable use of our soil and water resources. She now owns a Gondwanan rainforest sanctuary. I'm, um, I'll, I'll, you better watch out, Mary, because I'll be coming up to check the place out. Um, it, it sounds very good to me. It's up on the um, north coast of um, New South Wales and is developing uh, into an environmental education centre. She's, as I said, one of the five patrons of Sustainable Population Australia, Dr Mary White. Thank you, Paul. Um, I got that right so it's not booming at you. I'm, I'm going to do something very different today. I'm going to present the big picture approach to climate change so that we can understand what our living planet needs to restore the natural balances that have been upset by human activities. Without this understanding and our rapid response to halt further damage to the health of the earth and repair what we can, all we do to control global emissions, which is the main focus of international campaigns to control global warming, will be pointless. Can I have this light on here too? And that in my eyes, horrible, but still, yeah. No, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. That, that one shining on me is, is just a bit awkward, but don't worry, <laughs> sorry. More than that, the MDGs, whose laudable and noble aims are to improve the lot of humankind and think only of environmental sustainability in terms of human well-being, will be meaningless. We must have MDGs for the health and well-being of the Earth first and foremost. All of us have Homo sapiens, by using the wisdom implied by that name, must learn to see ourselves not as all-important and all-powerful, but as one of the quite incomprehensible number of living things that has had the privilege of being part of life on the only known living planet with a responsibility for its care. We have to accept the uncomfortable truth that humankind by living outside the laws of nature that govern the population numbers and environmental footprint of other species has, in this honeymoon period of only a relatively few thousand years, destabilized natural systems that have been billions of years in the making. And we've brought things to crisis point where this life-friendly planet is rapidly becoming hostile to life as we know it. Earth is the blue planet when viewed from space because it has water. If there hadn't been water, there wouldn't have been life. In fact, life is largely water and the special qualities of, of the water molecule enabled the formation of the first living cell. Water's ability to, to dissolve so many substances and to occur in different, different states over a wide range of temperatures makes it unique. Water vapour is a greenhouse gas and in the upper atmosphere it insulates our world from the cold of space. As snow and ice, 
it has an albedo effect, and albedo effect is something I'm coming back to shortly, very important things. Reflecting heat and modifying global climate. Water currents in the oceans are primary climate regulators, and in the atmosphere, air currents carrying water vapor have the same result. Global climate has been ever-changing over geological time, affecting the evolving biota. And today, of course, I can only touch on some of the life-connected aspects relevant to our understanding of present-day climate change problems. Microbial life started in the waters of a hostile planet with a toxic atmosphere of carbon dioxide, methane, sulfur gases and so on, and no oxygen, or just about no oxygen, about four billion years ago. And just by the way, in case it's of any interest, all life on this planet today, in all the kingdoms, is descended from these first bacterial ancestors, a continuum of life and we and all living things are constructed from bacterial building blocks. Now since that time, the time of that early bacterial world, life has been interacting with the environment, first making it and then keeping it life friendly. The first major breakthrough was the production of chlorophyll by cyanobacteria about 2.7 billion years ago, starting photosynthesis in which carbon dioxide is absorbed and oxygen is liberated. So, the creation of an atmosphere suitable for higher life forms was orchestrated by life itself. From this beginning, Earth has become the green planet, with the energy required for the metabolism of the, its living inhabitants supplied by the protists that include the algae in modern classifications and photosynthesizing bacteria in water environments and by the plant kingdom in the terrestrial realm. The sequestration of carbon in living matter and its conversion into sedimentary deposits and sometimes oil and gas over geological time has significance in the climate change problem as we're also very much aware. Now first let's see what makes Earth a living planet. It's the biosphere, a 20 kilometer deep zone like a membrane on a globe with a diameter of 6,400 kilometers, this very thin uh, membrane-like zone. It has been evolving for nearly four billion years and has become a complex entity in which all its life forms from microscopic bacterial to massive natural ecosystems in today's world are all in symbiotic relationships with each other and with the local and global environment. Everything in the national, natural world interconnected, interdependent and ever-changing. And we tend, I'm afraid, to forget the still essential role of bacteria and all the invisible microscopic organisms that is basic to life on this planet. The complex entity that results is a biosphere that has all the characteristics of a living organism. Living things metabolize and self-replicate. Non-living things don't. Earth's metabolism is the sum of all the metabolic functions of all the individuals in the networks of symbiotic life in the biosphere. Its self-replication is the sum of that of all its inhabitants. This living Earth, with its infinitely complex living systems and networks, behaves like, and in fact is, a superorganism. James Lovelock named it Gaia, that's the goddess of the Earth, and it is useful to think of its functioning like we think of a human body, maintaining healthy balances when all its components are functioning normally. Biodiverse natural vegetation, particularly forests, are the lungs of the planet. The hydrology and water fluxes via plants, part of the circulatory systems and so on. For the development of a functioning, healthy superorganism, all the living things in all the dynamic, ever-changing systems that have been subject to natural laws that control population numbers and environmental footprint in order that balances remain operative. 
to keep conditions within the narrow parameters that suit life.